So I'd like to start uh, by really thanking Kosman and Anna for inviting me. Um, I was invited uh, a couple years ago uh, to speak uh, at the, the conference um, that uh, Parasite organized. Uh, very often, of course, you, you start these, um, you, you start your presentation with these acknowledgments of thanking the host and everything like that, but I, I do really want to emphasize the, the question of, I mean, the, the theme of gratitude and of debt, uh, because the other thing I, I really want to apologize. Um, Kosman had come to me at, at lunch and said Pierre wasn't very, very well, and um, this is a conference that I, I really couldn't miss, but I should have said no to the invitation. You know, I, it's, not, it's not something that is completely unusual. A lot, a lot of people are really, really, you know, bad timing or whatever, and, but it's so important to come. So this sense of indebtedness. Um, also, um, so what I had, was, was planning was to do my presentation tonight, you know, work on it tonight. And then when Kosman says at lunch, you know, can you do it? I said, okay, I'll do it. That means I have to skip lunch. Uh, run back to the hotel, grab my computer, and prepare, you know, in 30 minutes instead of several hours over the evening. So I really want to apologize to my very esteemed uh, colleagues and, and, and to the audience member, and especially it's difficult to follow after Emily and Gabby's uh, presentations. But I'm very, very sympathetic to conveners, uh, and that's why I said yes, because it, it's just so difficult putting together uh, conferences. And, you know, rather than having a blank spot and then trying to cram it in uh, tomorrow. And it, it's something that you know, I thought I would address anyhow, because you know, the title of my presentation is The Performance of Looking Back at Performance. But in some ways, what I'm trying to do here is to speak to the institutionalizing of the body, you know, which, is, which is part of the theme uh, of today's sessions, you know, the question of the institution. And so convening, in some ways, is this formation of institutionalizing. So really, th and this is something that I've thought about quite a lot. What does it mean to bring people together to talk? Uh, and, you know, in this case, to talk about the body. So I thought, you know, I have those kind of con commitments to conference conveners, so I said yes. And so, again, uh, my sincerest apologies. Uh, this was put together rather quickly because I did want to listen to Emily and, and Gabby, so I, I just put down some notes. Now, when I say speak to the... Um, institution, uh, institutionalization of the body, I guess what I'm thinking about here is, is a, a sort of shift in emphasis. You have the body as an object of study or the body as a site of questioning. And so when you're convening around this term, the body, I want to sort of emphasize the latter, the body as a site of questioning rather than this body as an object of study. Now, one of the things, of course, is that the body is located. Now, if you'll forgive me further and indulge me if I, and allow me to speak a little bit about myself. Yeah. Okay, no, I mean, that's just a man to hang for, just leave her up there. <laughs> I'll talk about her in a second. Um, so just to say a few things, to update my CV as it were, you know, uh, Anna so kindly introduced me and mentioned that I have a job uh, as deputy director of the, the new Center for Contemporary Art in Singapore. I don't, I lost that job a couple of months ago. Um, and I continue to work there as a volunteer. Um, hopefully I'll get paid eventually. But the situation is this, I am a Malaysian citizen from Malaysia and uh, I've lived in Singapore for 20 years now. And I've lived there and I had a you know, permanent residence. But uh, a few years ago they took it away. They don't really explain, they just do that. And so for the last few years, I've lived as a tourist. Now, Malaysian tourists have this special condition where, because Malaysia is right next to Singapore, and if you just come in and out every day, um, you know, you might work illegally. So they want to make sure that Malaysian tourists have to be outside the country. So I end up traveling every couple of weeks um, and staying away, you know, like one week a month or anything like that. So when I got the job, when uh, Uta Mehta Bauer appointed me as her deputy, uh, we tried to get me an employment pass. And it took four months before they said no. And then we appealed. And then another month later, they said no. And they said, do not appeal again. And the university freaked out. And then, you know, I sort of completely lost any kind of formal relationship with them. Now, I say this, you know, maybe to get some of your sympathy so you'll be more sympathetic to me when I have this unprepared presentation. No, but actually, the point really is, um, you know, in talking about the self, I'm not trying to address my, con my specific conditions, but to really talk about, um, you know, conditions more generally, to, to generate empathy across positions. 
So this whole thing about being a tourist in a country that I consider my home, you know, I've lived in Singapore my, for 20 years and it's, it's, you know, I have attachments to there. I don't know why, but you know. Um, now notice, so, so, you know, I talked about being a tourist in my, my own home country and notice I didn't use the word exile. Um, my problems are really very petty in comparison to someone in exile. You know, I can come in and out of the country and actually no longer with, you know, anxiety when I, I wait for them to let me in the country. So I don't want to use, I didn't want to wield exile as a metaphor, but I still think that tourism might be useful. You know, it, it helps us think about detachments and, and distances. I don't want to redeem tourism, um, but, you know, there's something about the everyday curiosity um, you know, that tourism depends on. Uh, I'm not trying to celebrate the surface or, or, you know, think that there's a best form of tourism, but I'm interested in these sort of small estrangements. Although, you know, that's like the definition of tourism. It overlooks small estrangements. Um, I've been involved in Singapore for the arts community for the last 20 years, but I've become increasingly estranged by my present circumstances. I've been made into this sort of tourist where I'm newly discovering what it means to be a regular visitor who is not a citizen, but who can enter casually and easily, but is not at home. So this is, this I hope is, is um, you know, one wants to make, take advantage of the perspectives uh, that you are handed. So in some ways, this theme uh, will will inform a little bit of what I'm trying to think about. Because what I'm trying to argue for is that in thinking about the, the body, the body, you know, a field of study around the body, the body isn't a container. It doesn't contain things. It isn't something that you feel that you are at home with in some ways. But nonetheless, you have, you know, this interrogation of it. You have some kind of attachment to it. So this, I mean, one can talk about, thematize this distance and this detachment through exile or, or some other kinds of, of uh, unhomeliness, but I, wa I wanted to have something a little bit less grand, but nonetheless, uh, you know, a, a kind of distancing. Now I'm gonna speak about four artists. This is Amanda Heng. Um, I, I just scrambled and gave them some images, so, um, you know, they just put them together. The first artist I want to speak about is uh, Taishing. Taishing actually came to Hong Kong in 2010, and um, and and spoke here. Um, I'm I'm sure many of you are familiar with his work, um, but let me just very briefly talk about um, uh, about his work. Uh, from the late from 1979 to the end of um, to the end of 1999, he did a series of, one, uh, of performances, five of which were one-year performances, and another, the, the final one was a 13-year plan. Um, this one here is the time clock piece uh, done from 1980 to 1981, where in this kind of military uniform, he would punch uh, you know, a time clock uh, every hour on the hour, 24 hours a day, every day of the year. He shaved his head in the beginning, and he just let it grow naturally. Uh, it meant he couldn't sleep, you know, continuously. He would always wake up, you know, on the hour. He'd have to punch in at the at the hour, so that there's the one minute sort of uh, interval. Um, and he, you know, did this these series of performances while an uh, illegal uh, immigrant in the United States. Um, he finally got amnesty, I think, in the late 80s, um, after he did all of the, the one-year performances. Now, Taishing's originally from Taiwan. He um, left Taiwan uh, in 74, and when he was in the United States working with the, on, as a, on, on a ship, he jumped ship, and then you know, went uh, to New York and tried to be an artist there. He finally returned, I mean, when he, when he, he, he and Adrian Heathfield put together this book, Out of Now, and when they translated it into Chinese, uh, then he decided to do a lecture tour in Taiwan. And he's never spoken in public in Taiwan until 2012. And I was very fortunate to be part of this uh, lecture tour with, with uh, Taishing. So it was Adrian Heathfield, Taishing, of course, uh, uh, Gong Jiaojun, the translator, and myself as, you know, uh, you know we went to tai, uh, the, the Fine Art Museum, to Tainan, and then back to the Taipei Academy of Fine Art. Now, 
we had been doing the same thing, you know, uh, Taishin would talk, Adrian would talk, I would talk, Zhao Jun would convene uh, a discussion. Um, so we did that. And then um, in Taipei, Fine Art uh, um, College, we thought to mix it up a little bit. So Taishin would talk a little bit, then Adrian would say a few things, Taishin would talk again, and then I would say a few things rather than, than uh, repeat this sort of um, relay race that we had done. Now, after a while, this woman in the audience um, in our third uh, presentation, she asked a question or she raised her hand to make a comment. She said, you know, there are two um, movie stations, cable movie stations in Taiwan, HBO and, and Star Movies. And HBO is so much more popular because they don't have commercials. So could you and Adrian, you know, stop being commercials interrupting Taishing? You know, that's what she said. And then we broke for lunch and it was really unfortunate because I, I, I didn't get a chance to um, come back to, 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 to uh, talk about that, to respond. Now, of course, you know, when you watch a movie, you know, it's the thing itself, the story constructed of sound and images and, and so forth, that the viewer experiences and engages. Um, what's very interesting with, with uh, Taishing is that, you know, the, the, um, if, if we're thinking about something like this, the, the time clock piece film, so, you know, every time he um, punched in, he would take a picture. And you know, 24 frames a second, you know, a, a day in, in a second, uh, the whole year in about six minutes. So if you were watching that, right, um, you know, what what is it that you are actually experiencing? You're not experiencing the Taishing performance by looking at the film. And I think one of the things that's really quite interesting is that with Taishing, the relationship between the document or even his stories. It's all about pointing to the performance. And when you listen to Taishing talk uh, about his work, it's filled with all sorts of very interesting anecdotes and details that, you know, he starts out with something so simple. It's a proposition. I will, you know, do this. I will punch, you know, uh, a time clock every hour on the hour for the whole year. It's a very simple statement. As you listen to his story, what unfolds is all the complexity of something so simple. You know, what does it mean? What, what does um, the difference between uh, being an artist under those kinds of conditions and living a regular life for a year as opposed to the space in between one year performances? I think also what Taishing's um, work does is it makes us think you know, or, or there's some interpretation that Taishing's artistic medium wasn't his body itself or his life itself so much, but the passing of time. And of course, the passing of time is something that is so ir uh, ineluctably subjective. But in some ways, I think what he does is he always tries to offer himself as a general subject. You know, so all the subjective details are there, but it still is this generic subject experiencing um, the, you know, experiments in time. For me, thinking about Taishing and thinking about how we then have that relationship to Taishing's body, um, the idea that the document, the story, uh, the image points to a performance, but what is the performance itself? You know, it's not necessarily, or it's not so clearly uh, uh, the performance of the body and time. You know, what is it? You know, it really is this very, very deep, thorough, fundamental questioning. Um, sorry, now I get back to Amanda. Okay, so the other artist I wanna talk about is Amanda Hang. And um, in my talk two years ago, I mentioned Amanda. So I'm repeating myself here, but that's also another theme of mine is this idea of the repetition of performance or the repetition of, of telling of performance. So Amanda did a performance in 2000 and uh, we met at a theater space um, and then from the theater space we walked to a Hawker Center food court. And um, you know, the performance was called Walk with Amanda. Now when we arrive at the Hawker Center, we see Amanda has been there for some time and she's been putting pink tablecloths on the normally, you know, just hard plastic, you know, uh, unadorned um, Hawker Center tablecloths. Now, one could think that the performance at stake here is Amanda doing stuff, right? But what I found very interesting, and I think it's, it's a, an opinion shared by a number of people, is that when we arrived, we came from a theater company. We were paying audiences. 
But when we arrived, we saw Amana, and by virtue of doing what she was doing, a crowd had gathered, a crowd of people from the Hawker Center. And so for me, the performance starts not when Amanda generates a crowd at the Hawker Center, but when she creates an intersection between a Hawker Center crowd looking at an art audience. And it's these mutually, you know, these mixed recognitions and recognitions between the two groups. This is again, you know, for me, this, this performance, what's so interesting is it's about looking at performance. That is what's at stake. The body is essential. Without Amanda's body, you don't generate the conditions of the performance. But it's really this, you know, the body, you know, how the body has created um, conditions of discourse in some ways. Now, Ray Langenbach has talked very much in his theorizing of performance art about the idea of glancing and gazing. One can gaze at Amanda's body, you know, fixate on the object, or one can think about the mutual glances that the, the crowd and the, the audience have towards each other. A couple of other uh, performances that I want to talk about. Um, oh, sorry. Ah, how do I get back? Okay, there. Okay. Um, now, in 1993, 94, so 20 years ago, Joseph Ung uh, did this um, performance. The Artist Village and Fifth Passage uh, had been doing these New Year's events, and they were, you know, mini art festivals. They had installation, uh, um, artworks. Uh, film screenings, and then a performance program. So they did this a couple of years in a row. For this one, they were get, generating a lot of interest from the tabloid newspaper, the new paper. So they started covering the event. And then the organizers are saying, look, you know, you're covering it, you're sensationalizing everything. You know, this is an era in Singapore where there's still a lot of anxiety about um, censorship and, and so forth. Not that censorship has, has uh, stopped. But for this particular performance by Joseph Ung, the theme was um, police had basically entrapped a number of people, you know, uh, who were soliciting for gay sex. So they they were entrapped, and as part of their, they got convicted, and as part of their sentence, they were going to be caned. I think three three uh, lashes of the cane, and so Joseph took this uh, theme. Uh, in the performance. And the performance was like a 20 minute performance and it involved many, many things. I won't go into, into detail. And at one point, he steps into the back of the space and the space is even longer than this. And so the audience is, let's say, gathered at this end and all the way at the back of the room, Joseph goes there and he's wearing sort of black swimming trunks. He lowers them a little bit. He trims his pubic hair. He returns the pubic hair to this installation of tofu and packets of chili and then he proceeds to, to cane that. So, you know, this got covered by the tabloid um, pubic protest. And because of just the coverage, the National Arts Council freaked out and banned performance art, or tried to ban it, all right, for about 10 years. Um, now, you know, Lu Zihan um, started doing, so, so the performance was very, very controversial. A lot of people in the arts community uh, trying to show, you know, how quickly they would get on their, their knees and kowtow to the state was starting to condemn the performance, having not seen it and just on the basis of you know, this kind of salacious reporting. Nobody who took any positions against the performance had actually seen it. Um, but you know, nonetheless, this you know, uh, sent shockwaves in the arts community in Singapore. Um, Zihan, more recently, has been doing a, you know, a, a reenactment of the performance. Now, what happened was Ray Langenbach um, had filmed it, right? But this film, then he deep sixed it, he, he hid it. Uh, but during the trial of Joseph Ong, because he ended up getting convicted for obs obscenity, um, he had an affidavit that tried to explain the performance. So he, from, you know, from studying the film and his memory, he wrote down a, a, you know, a, a script of it, what, what had happened. A lot of the contestation over the performance and censorship of it was that it was unscripted, this anxiety that you know, there was spontaneity in art and the government just couldn't handle it. You know? So um, Zihan was really interested in reading the script out loud and then following the script and it was this idea that 
a performance that was supposed to be unscripted and it had its charge all of a sudden by just reenacting it. Now, he did this in school in Chicago. He had done it in Singapore. And then he did it as part of a theater festival, the same one, the same theater company, actually, uh, the Necessary Stage that, did, uh, that, that uh, presented Amanda's um, earlier. And very strangely, there was an another set of controversy over Zihan's performance. It was so funny that the same people that supported Joseph Ong were supporting Zihan, but, but you know, it was different people who were, who were now very anxious. They, they were thinking about the commodification, the, the way that maybe Zihan was trying to vampire off the fame or the notoriety of Joseph. But they, they, they really didn't seem to, to understand, I think, Zihan's motivations. Now, Zihan then restaged it. In, I mean, he, he, he did this in Chicago. So this is him doing it in Chicago at the School of the Art Institute. And this is him doing it in Singapore at the substation where I used to work. Uh, and that's the red packets and the tofu and the caning and, and so forth. Um, Zihan did some, some different things. But during his presentation at the substation, what he did was he read the script, uh, then he reenacted it. But he reenacted it not according to his script, but to his reenactment in Chicago, the film of which. He was almost like playing against the film. It was almost like this hall of mirrors of, of representations. The other thing that Zihan did was he read texts from the period, the 90s, when all the, news, the newspaper was having all these kinds of condemnations of what Joseph Ng had done. And I lived through all of that, and I was a, you know, a very uh, engaged actor in all of that. And it was shocking to me, because back then, I knew that whoever wrote these stupid columns defending the, the government, you know, they would have history bite them on the ass really soon. And it was just it's very funny to live to that moment 20 years later when you know, the people who said, yes, we shouldn't do these things, art must be very patient. You know, what a fucking idiot you were to write it back then. And you can see that happening in that space. So that experience was really quite interesting. And then Zihan played for the first time Ray's film document of it. And what's really interesting, yeah, thanks, I see, I see the five minutes, um, is how you know, this, for all the charge of Zihan's body at the substation by reenacting it, you know, there was part of the performance where Joseph burnt a cigarette into his arm and Zihan did the same. Um, it was the film, I think, because the film hadn't been ever seen in public that had a certain kind of charge. So it's, it's these sort of images and representations of the body. Now, I don't really have a conclusion. If I had this evening to think about all these things, maybe I would have. But let me reiterate my, my purpose. You know, I've talked about visualizing the body and by saying looking, the performance of looking back at, at, uh, at performance art, this whole looking sort of privileges the visual. But I hope my examples here, you know, with Taishing She, Amanda, Joseph Ng, and Zihan, I've, I've, you know, I've showed that I'm concerned precisely with interrogating the limits of looking. I've also talked about distancing, you know, the idea of, of you know, trying to, you know, what is Zihan doing by th uh, thinking, you know, uh, looking back? Is he trying to remember a performance, trying to recuperate? I think those kinds of questions come up about how, um, you know, we think about remembering and, and the distances involved there. I'm not only just wanting to privilege distances because of the violence of the state, but also the very process of thinking through, you know, uh, what, we've, what we've done. Um, Lastly, um, you know, Adrian Heathfield uses this word to, do, to talk about Taishing, the untimely. Taishing, uh, the title of his book is Out of Now, meaning it comes from the now, but it's also somehow outside of the now. It has that wonderful double meaning. So Taishing's untimeliness. And uh, as, as some of you in the audience know, you know, Joseph Ng has moved away from Singapore. And, and ironically, you know, he's become actually a very successful um, art professional and, uh, you know, a gallerist. Uh, I'm sure the, you know, the Singapore government, sometimes all they really care about is if you make a lot of money, we will we'll forgive you. Um, I guess, you know, by framing a little bit my own sort of situation, but obviously, you know, it comes up many, many times throughout the artists that I've talked about, Taishing and Joseph. The unhomely has also been uh, this kind of uh, perspective. So, you know, this, these ideas of the untimely and the homely, unhomely in terms of how we're questioning the body. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you very much, and thanks for your indulgence.